Welcome to the Dallas Fed. I've, I've known John for many years. John is an outstanding CEO, uh, but he's very active uh, in the community in New York, and he's been very active with other institutions, in particular, Harvard Business School, where I was uh, way back when, senior associate dean. And as you just heard, John was chairman of the capital campaign, and we travel around the country. By the way, Rob was faculty chair of the capital campaign, so he and I are partners. So we spent a lot of time together, but it, but it told me a lot about John, and I learned about John over those many months, uh, in many cases, grueling months. He's running a company, he's got his hands full, and he's traveling around with me <laughs> around the country, you know, trying to raise money for an institution. But that's the kind of person John is. He's trying to make the world a better place. He's a great role model, in my opinion, for CEOs, for community leaders. And so that's why I was thrilled to have the opportunity to have him here at the Dallas Fed. And we're glad to have all, all of you here tonight. I'm going to ask because I do it every time. How many of you are coming to the Dallas Fed for the first time? Okay, so that's interesting. So that tells you something. And how many have been here before, obviously, to these events? So we're building a, building a franchise here, I guess. So, <laughs> but we're thrilled to have you here. Um, and, uh, and so let me get right into it. And so let's, for those who don't know, how did you get into this business? And your, your family obviously was in the business, your father sure. and other relatives. How did, what's the history of Hess, your family, and how did you get into this business? Thank you, and it's an honor to be here, um, uh, and nice to see all of you. Our company started actually 85 years ago. Uh, my father was the fourth uh, kid during the Depression. His three siblings went to college, and when it came to him at 16 years old, there was no money left. So he had to go to work. Uh, he started by carrying bags of 100 pounds of coal each on his back. He, after about a month of that, he said, there's got to be a better way to make a living. And he bought a secondhand oil truck that's currently in our Houston uh, office building uh, that uh, really propelled the company to the company it, it is today. Uh, he was accounts receivable, accounts payable, inventory, customer relations, all the above and really was able to pyramid his uh, uh, oil truck into oil terminals, into refineries, into gas stations. And then in 1969, uh, we merged with a company called Amarada, Amar for America, Ada for right. uh, Canada, and it was based in Tulsa. And that really got us in the exploration production business. But at that time, maybe we were two thirds refining and marketing, one third exploration production. But that got us into the state of Texas. And you knew I had to bring that up sooner or later. And uh, we were in the East Texas field. We were in the Seminole field in the western part of the state uh, where we had a tertiary recovery project that we just uh, uh, monetized a year ago because our business is so capital intensive. Those of you in the energy business, you, you have to pick and be very focused uh, what you're going to invest in, especially in a lower price world where you want to go down the cost curve. So uh, those businesses we sold uh, because we had better return opportunities elsewhere. We also had a term Terminal in Galena Park uh, in Houston. Uh, and uh, what we have in Texas to this day is the most important part. That's our people center. Our operating headquarters are in Houston. Uh, and we can listen to offers from Dallas. Uh, but we have about 1,000 people uh, in Houston. And I come to Dallas a lot because some of our partners are here. So that sort of gives you a feel for the history of the company. And my own uh, uh, history is that you know I was lucky to grow up uh, at the side of my father. He was uh, a tremendous visionary. He really felt it was noble to provide work for others. Uh, that was our sense of social responsibility as a family. Um, and at the end of the day, he was a great taskmaster. Uh, mm -hmm. He had an incredible memory. He used it on me all the time. And uh, I, when I became CEO, you know, we had this great company, but it's a competitive world. There's disruption then, there's disruption now. And I decided that it was best for us just to be in the exploration and production business, notwithstanding uh, the commodity risk that we've just had for the last four years from oil prices, we felt that was a better place to put our money long term than being an integrated company or refining and marketing. And did you always know you were going to go into this business? You always knew growing up you were going to go into this business. Well, you know, it's a great question. And by the way, Harvard Business School, and we've talked about this, played a big role to give me the confidence to be able to, you know, sort of stand on my own feet for my own principles, if you will. And, and I would recommend it to, to any of the younger people that are thinking about it. 
But in my own case, I just was always um, uh, captivated by the energy business. I was captivated because energy is so important to human prosperity, lifting people out of poverty. It's a global business, so you get to meet people from the Mideast, from Asia, uh, also different parts of our own country. So the people part, as well as the technical part, as well as the geopolitical part, all, you know, I would say just enthralled me. Uh, I started draw, uh, 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 working at a gas station when I was 16. By the way, the legal age was 18, so don't huh. tell anyone. Anybody. Um, Were and, you pumping gas? Oh yeah, I loved it. I loved it. <laughs> uh, and and you know that's a real customer facing yes, business. Yes, it is. Yeah, um, that's great. And, and then after I pumped gas, uh, spent time in our refineries, spent time on oil rigs, wow. um, and you know learned the business from the ground up. And you took a little break to go to college and Harvard Business School. Did you work in the business while you were in school too? Uh, in the summers I did. In the summers, in the summers you did, okay. Did, yeah. But at least took a little time. A little time. And then you went right back. Then I went right back. I, I just love the business. Well, now having said that, with my, I have three boys. Uh, one's 32, the other's about to be 30, and the uh, baby is not a baby anymore, is 24. Uh -huh. I really encourage them to try other things, to figure out what their passion is, and then work hard at your passion, you're gonna be happy. So, so uh, I'm a big believer in and as a parent, you want to have your child really do what challenges them and what they have a passion for as opposed to imposing your own interest on them. Uh, that is advice I'll remember because I still have, still have to go through that yeah. uh, with my two. Um, so uh, you have a number of your businesses are outside the United right. States. You might talk about what you're doing globally. Uh, in, in other geographic areas outside the U.S. Okay, I'd be happy to do that. Just so you all know, we're about 70% United States in terms of our production. We're in North Dakota in the Bakken. We're one of the leading oil and gas producers there. Produce about 125,000 barrels a day of oil and gas going up uh, in the next couple of years to 200,000 barrels a day, and we'll run that for a cash generation uh, role in the company. We're also in the deepwater Gulf of Mexico. We're one of the five uh, top producers uh, there, um, and, and we have about 70,000 barrels a day of production. Production. What's interesting about the Gulf of Mexico, and I will get to the international in a second, uh, is that uh, 10 years ago, uh, about 8,800 blocks were under lease to companies like ours, whether it's Exxon, whether it's Conoco, with smaller companies. Today, the number of blocks leased in the Gulf of Mexico is 2,500. So there's been a liquidation huh. of the Gulf of Mexico in part because so much money went to shale, right. and in part because oil prices are so low and you have to make tough choices. It doesn't work. We decided to stay in the offshore business, yeah. but also the onshore business, because what people don't realize is shale is about 6% of world oil supply. It'll grow probably to 10% of world oil supply by 2025, and then it plateaus. What people don't realize, even though there's an obsession about it here in this country and probably a rational fear in the rest of the world, shale is not the next Saudi Arabia. It's very important. It's an important part of the uh, short cycle mix of oil supply in the world, but we're going to need a lot more than shale. If all shale goes is uh, to 10% of uh, world supply, who's investing in the other 90%? What percentage is shale now of your production? Uh, right in about half. It's about half yes. today. Wow. Yes, that's right. And 10 years ago? Uh, 10 years ago, it was like zero. Zero. Okay, yeah. so wow. Uh, yeah. So, and the break-evens, we talk a lot here uh, about, and no. we, do, uh, we do extensive surveys, you may know, uh, about the break-evens. How do you compare the break-evens then for shale versus Gulf of Mexico, et cetera? Great question. Uh, and, and there's a lot of misinformation out, I'd say, about shale companies as opposed to shale wells, but also how the offshore competes against that. So let me try to answer the question. Um, when oil prices tanked from $100 a barrel to let's say $40 a barrel, um, American ingenuity was put to task, uh, whether it's in the Permian, the Bakken, or the Eagleford. And Tremendous work was done on improving operating efficiencies, uh, cycle times, wells that used to take 30 days to drill, you could drill, mm. let's say, in 12 days. So that's where the operating efficiencies come in on costs, but also on technology, closer spacing, wells that would be 700 feet apart, maybe 500 feet apart, uh, putting more sand and the frack job, uh, uh, geo steering, going where you, you have the sweet spots and the shale horizons. So all those things together on cost efficiencies probably brought costs down 50%, and on productivity from technology probably bought your recovery per well up 50%. So shale and shale producers and American entrepreneurs were able to deal with a price drop. I think Saudi Arabia thought they were going to put us out of business. Right. If anything, we got stronger in business. I'm very proud of that uh, for our country. Having said that, 
that, you ask the question, what's the break even? And one of the frustrations when you go to uh, investor conferences, I was just at one at Credit Suisse and before that Goldman Sachs uh, in Florida in, in January, 90% of the conversation is about shale. Yeah. So there's an obsession about shale yeah. in the investment community. And, and the interesting thing is people say, oh, we can make money at $40.50. Uh, as a company, no. Uh, I'd say over half uh, 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 of the rigs that are drilling in the Permian right now, a um, uh, hundred of the 400 rigs are from private equity, and about a hundred are for companies capitalized less than $3 billion. Uh, most of those companies, because they don't have uh, other things in their portfolio, uh, at 52 or $53 WTI where we are now, they're running negative deficits. Mm -hmm. So you are starting to see certain companies cut back on CapEx, starting to drop rigs. The rig count peaked at uh, 1080 about a month ago. Now it's about 1050. So, so if people were doing so well at 52, how come CapEx is coming down and rigs are coming down? Having said that, um, you know, $60 WTI, I think would be a fair price where people can make an adequate return, service companies can stay alive, uh, and things would flow well. So I'd say 52 where we are right now is more uh, in an unstable area. $60 and above would be good. And for offshore, the break-even is higher? Well, that's a great or question. Or the up, big upfront costs and break, incremental costs uh, actually lower? I, I'm going to actually share a, a story. I, I was at a oil conference called Oil Money. It's the worst named conference I've ever been to. But it's a great conference. It's in London in October. And uh, oil ministers go there, OPEC members, uh, heads of oil companies. It's a good networking experience, but you also learn from it. And some of the top uh, executives in the exploration and production uh, business were on a stage like this. And they were asked the question that you were just asking. What's better to invest in, shale or the offshore deep water? And it's not either or, it's and. It's the best rocks for the best returns. So in today's environment, can you find offshore opportunities where you can make as much, if not more money uh, than shale? Absolutely. But you have to have really good science and you have to have the right rocks. Now, we're very fortunate. You were saying, where do we do business out outside of the US? One of the things, because we had a macro view, we have a 10-year investment horizon. We thought shale was great, but it would plateau in the middle of the next decade. If we have a 10-year investment horizon, we need to start planting the seeds now. What's for after shale? So we stayed in the offshore business. Right. We were very fortunate. Uh, uh, as others were pulling out because you had to make tough choices as oil prices went from $100 to $50, we decided that we would try to get some low-cost options in offshore exploration. One country that we went to is the country of Guyana. By the way, I didn't know where Guyana was until we made this investment. It's the country directly east from Venezuela. Um, Exxon had a large uh, holding there of 1,150 Gulf of Mexico blocks. Remember, a block is three miles by three miles. So it's a lot of uh, hunting territory. And Shell had just pulled out of the deal with Exxon. So Exxon was looking to lay off because uh, they had a drilling obligation that they had to do in 2015. They were looking to lay off to 50%. And we did 30%. The Chinese National Offshore Oil Company did 25%. The rest is history. We've been very, very lucky. It's some of the most prolific reservoirs in the world. We've had 12 significant discoveries. And we found about 5 billion barrels of oil equivalent. Hess is 30%. Uh, uh, the, the wells there are drilled to 15,000 feet, where in the Gulf of Mexico it's 25 or 30,000 feet. So the drilling is relatively cheap. And, and right now the plans are to do five production ships of 700. 50,000 barrels a day that would be on by 2025. So if you find the right rock, mm -hmm. you can make as much, if not more money in the offshore than you do in the onshore. Because we've had a lot of discussion here, and we have a lot of discussion even at the Federal Open Market Committee about the fact that uh, we haven't seen the long-lived investment. I take That's it the right. offshore is long-lived, yes. long useful life, and we know shale, more nimble, shorter cycle, but rapid decline curve. Why are the big? Why are the majors so reluctant? It appears, and maybe I've, why are they so reluctant to uh, make these long-lived investments? And they're focusing mainly on shale. Why are they doing that? Uh, shale, it, once you find it, is lower risk. 
It's an assembly line. It's very capital intensive. And what people don't realize, it takes about 10 years from your initial investment before you become cash flow positive. This is on? On shale. On shale. It can be the Permian. It can be the Bakken. Uh, and the reason I bring it up is uh, about three years ago, shale was the darling of the investment community for the reasons you're talking about. It right. was low risk. It was short cycle time. Right. You could turn it down when prices were low. You could turn it up right. when prices are high. But, but because it's so capital intensive, investors have changed from drill baby drill, just go for production growth, to show me the money. Meaning as you grow, attenuate your growth so you return some capital to shareholders uh, on the right. way. That actually is very important, that, that shale producers show more financial discipline and they don't spend all their cash every year. Now, in the offshore, uh, because it's a three-year time frame of a lot of money up front, investment, uh, investment period, uh, a lot of people started to pull back because it didn't have the flexibility in a low price environment to turn on or off. Once you're committed in an offshore development, you're, you're committed. In, yeah. But I think the, the, the other point that's uh, really important is uh, the world needs to invest and this is from the International Energy Agency, and I would refer to all of you. They do a world energy outlook every year. Uh, they're very balanced about climate change, the need for oil, the need for renewables. So it's a good primer for all of us to read. Uh, so when you think about uh, the different takeaways, one is on the word investment. Uh, the real casualty uh, from the low prices of $40 and $50 that we had for three years, and we just had another dip that we don't need from 76 to 42, and yes, I do know the numbers, from the beginning of October to the end of December, is the real casualty of low prices has been this word investment. And what's interesting is the IEA says you have to spend $580 billion a year globally for oil and gas production to grow with demand growth and meeting production declines. Three years ago, that number was $350 billion. Two years ago, that number was $370 billion. Last year, that number was $410 billion. And this year, it's going to be $430 billion. So we've had four years of underinvestment. Right. What's interesting in this, to your point, mm -hmm. is shale is the only thing that's up in that time period. Mm -hmm. And as Jeff, In terms of investment. In terms of investment. As Jeff Curie, your associate mm -hmm. from Goldman Sachs said, right. he's the head of commodities research, very yeah. smart guy. Yeah, guy. He said the problem with shale isn't too much oil, it's too much money. What did he mean by that? What he meant by that is $50 billion. I hope we're okay, Rob. <laughs> 50, if I see him run, we're all if, going. If we're not okay, <laughs> you're in the right building. Okay, good. That's true. It was uh, a little, I, I don't I know about you guys, it was a little hard to get place, in here. This is the safest yeah. place in town. Yeah, no, it is safe. <laughs> but, but what can't get in, can't get out. But, but, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, I, I'm going to run out yeah. of things to say in 15 minutes. But anyway, yeah, go on. Here, 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 here's the real takeaway on shale. Uh, it's the only thing that went up in investment over the three to four year period. It wasn't from internal cash flow because oil prices were 40 and $50 right, a barrel. Right. It was from outside equity. $50 billion of public equity was thrown at shale to grow and t $20 billion of private equity was thrown at shale to, to, to grow. So shale got back on its feet when prices were low. It's only now that investors are having some remorse because they're not seeing the cash being given back because it's all going back in the so ground. So let me make sure that I'm just... Do, do, is the conventional wisdom right, and this is just uh, uh, sure. that uh, uh, the investment in these long life projects is just too risky because if you drill for three years and you find out you don't have the right rock, well, well, there's, actually, there's more there's more variation in the outcomes than in shale. You know, you know what really and happened, Rob? It, it was you had so much money taken out of the business, you had to make choices. And because shale is flexible, uh, in each each decision Safer is $5 risk million dollars instead of a billion okay. dollars, it was just a aversion to capital okay. risk, I would say. So, so. Having said that, what people also don't realize, remember I said shale's going from 6% of world oil supply to 10%. Who's investing in the other 90%? While shale has gone up in investments, gotten back on its feet, uh, areas outside of shale from 2014 are down 40%. So you're seeing global exploration that used to be $100 billion a year is now $40 billion a year. You remember what I said about Gulf of Mexico leases? 8,800 were leased uh, 10 years ago, now it's 2,500. So a lot of capital has okay. gone out of long cycles. So uh, what's the biggest challenge you're facing as you run this business today? The biggest challenge is price. 
I mean, when you have oil prices go from $76 a barrel for WTI in October, and then they go to $42, and you're making a 10-year investment, how do you manage? Right. And I think the real lesson in that, we've always talked about it, don't run out of cash. It's a cliche, and I'm here at the Federal Reserve, so we're going to try to cut a deal later. But So but, make sure you don't get over leveraged. Yes, it's so important. And, and you know, we, we we're talking about asset bubbles and yep. what happens if the economy slows and uh, different companies being over levered. I think the real challenge in a 10-year business like ours is to make sure you have a very conservative balance sheet and a strong cash position. So when we were lucky enough to get these positions in Guyana, yeah. it came with a price tag. Right. Somewhere between $500 million and a billion dollars a year of cash that we really didn't have. Right. Uh, and yet it's one of the best high return investments we could have dreamed of in our company's history. So what we did two and three years ago was sell $3.8 billion of mature assets that were high cost, mm. bank the cash. We had a little extra for p paying down debt. We had a little extra for uh, uh, share buybacks, but the majority was the bank cash. So we have $2.6 billion of cash right now, which is a lot for our company, to ensure that even if you have $40 oil, you can make it to when Guyana comes on in 2020. Okay, so I'm gonna switch subjects a little bit, then we're gonna turn to the audience and, and we'll come back. Uh, you and I have talked about this a lot over the last five years. If you do uh, surveys of um, the public about what they think of business yes. and CEOs, you and I have talked about the fact, and maybe led by the financial industry, which I was part of, so I can, we can start there, but the, the view of business people is, uh, is, much, is probably lower yes. and corporates and the positive impact on society, and we're having more discussion which is a, is part of the Fed. I'll stay away from the political aspects, but a lot of discussions about the role of business, uh, role of share repurchase, the role uh, of, of making society better. Uh, what 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 do you think business leaders in this country need to do to uh, keep building or rebuild, in some cases, the trust of the public? Uh, I think we need to engage much more. Engage means not just have a narrative, but also be a good listener. Uh, and, and I think when you talk about engagement, it's with all your stakeholders. Obviously your employees, uh, your business partners and contractors, your board, your shareholders. But then let's get to the other part where I think maybe business leaders fall a little short, which is the communities where we do business. That's why an outreach like this is so important, uh, to have two-way communication uh, and engagement. I think it's also important with government leaders. How do you educate people about climate change? It's not the what, it's the how. And let's try to solve the problem together. Instead of me, you, it's we. And I also think the media. Uh, and, and so... I, I think business leaders don't make the case for how important our system is, uh, how important we are to job creation, uh, and how business is truly a force for good. And unless we engage and we stand to be accountable um, and, and have our message heard, how, how can you not expect the counter narrative to be so negative towards us? So I think too many business leaders have sort of hidden in caves uh, and they should get out there and engage. And you know, there, there'll be some unpleasant meetings in that, but as part of that, I think we'll get a common understanding how the American system is the preferred system and how business plays such an important role to, role to create jobs and better people's lives. So, and I noticed this just uh, watching television this morning, but you know him and I know him. Paul Tudor Jones yes. made a comment, which I think got a lot of attention, saying there's been a mania recently about uh, uh, shareholders. Maybe it's gone a little too far. Yes. And that... Um, you know, the multiple of what a CEO gets paid versus the average employee has gone like this. And um, and maybe it's not surprising that's going to engender backlash. Do you have any, have any comment Well, on you that? know, I think there are certain businesses that probably that's true. And, you know, why do investors give those businesses money if the return ratio is so lopsided to one side versus the other? That could be against the investor or it could be employees working in that company. So I think it's a fair concern. Uh, and one, uh, one size doesn't fit all. Uh, but at the end of the day, more people uh, need to be pulled up from the economic growth in this country than has occurred. And I think that's a question we need to engage on. All right, let's go to the audience here. Let's take some questions, then we'll come back. Please, sir. I loved your talk. Thank you. Uh, 
Tell me about Venezuela. What is your opinion? Is it World War III? Uh, I, I'll give some perspective. Uh, I've got a couple of stories I want to tell here. First of all, I, 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 our company has had strong ties with Venezuela. Fortunately, not currently. Uh, but uh, first things first, my father proposed to my mother when he was building the business with oil terminals and buying <laughs> oil and bringing it up to New Jersey and New York where we had oil terminals. He actually proposed to my mother from Caracas. Oh, wow. so, so when I started to do business with Venezuela, I, you know, I pulled every uh, rule and joke in the book. And I said, you know, I'm part Venezuelan because my father proposed to my mother from here. Uh, but, but having Having said that, we ended up, we had a refinery in the U.S. Virgin Islands, and it was really challenged. It was a time a lot of national oil companies were providing discounted oil to refineries to have outlets for the oil, and we couldn't compete on that. So we ended up making a deal with PDVSA, Petróleos de Venezuela, uh, the national oil company, to basically do a joint venture in the Virgin Islands, and it extended our refinery there for about 10 years. But then a thing called shale gas came along. 5% of a refinery's expenses are fuel, and uh, we were competing against $12 a barrel of gas here, and we'd pay $100 a barrel for our fuel. So we started to hemorrhage the business. We ended up closing the business down. So we've had some, I've had some experience with the Venezuelan people, very nice, but you know, the political system there didn't work. And basically, I would say uh, Chavez, who I've met, commandeered the country. Now you have Maduro, and now you have a failed state. A lot of Venezuelans can't get food. They mm. can't get health care. Uh, it's a country in implosion. So, so, you know, I hope uh, without bloodshed, uh, they can get new leadership because the model they have now is failing. Uh, but it remains to be seen because I think Maduro has a very strong uh, uh, fist on the military. And as long as he's got the military, I think he's going to stay in power. And it remains to be seen if by us putting sanctions on Venezuela and other uh, Western countries agreeing and supporting us, that we actually can have him moved out and have uh, Guaido moved in. So I don't know the answers here, but I do know it's a failed state. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, what is your company doing about climate change? Great question. Uh, climate change, first of all, is real. Uh, and uh, I, I think it's probably the greatest challenge uh, our uh, society has. How do you grow uh, energy by a third by 2040 and decrease our carbon footprint at the same time? Most people don't understand uh, the how. They understand the what. We all agree on the what. But the how, and I would recommend this to all of you because we've had to get educated, our boards had to get educated, and I'll come back to what specifically we do to set an example on this. But part of the work that we do is try to educate people on the how. There's work by uh, Princeton called the Princeton Wedges. You can get it on your iPhone. You go to Google. Uh, it'll come right up. And it explains what you have to do to grow supply for that 30% increase in demand growth, but also decrease the carbon footprint. And they're called 15 wedges. Each wedge is an initiative. I'll give you an example of what a wedge is. Uh, each one is pretty Herculean in what you have to do. You have to go from 400 nuclear plants to 1,200 nuclear plants. By the way, after mm. Fukushima, I don't think the public will mm. is there. And each plant probably costs $10 billion. Someone's got to pay for it. And not many people have balance sheets that can accommodate that. You have to convert a coal electric plant to a natural gas electric plant every week uh, for 45 years. You have to do 2 million windmills. Instead of having 30 miles a gallon, you got to have 60. You have to stop deforestation. You get the point. You have to do 15 of these Herculean things. So I think what we as industry have failed to do is make people understand the enormous task we have ahead where we need more energy, and oil and gas will probably be 50% of the mix, uh, even with 300 million electric vehicles on the road by 2040, and yet still make the carbon footprint go down. So we are all for engaging on the subject, but we want to make sure the public, government officials, and business have a common understanding. Have you looked at actually, you know, we do a lot of work on this. Texas, for example, is the yes. largest wind producing state yes. in the country. Have you looked in your business saying we maybe we ought to invest or back some of these initiatives? Uh, two, two points. Uh, uh, we, when we were in the refining and marketing business, as well as the exploration uh, production business, uh, we invested in hydrogen fuel cells. And we're still waiting for a payout on that. Uh, huh. But, you know, cars that are fueled on hydrogen actually can have 90 miles a gallon. 
Wow. So that could be a great answer. What people don't realize about batteries versus gasoline, yeah. a kilogram of energy from a battery versus a kilogram of energy from gasoline, the gasoline has 60 times more power stored in it. So batteries have a lot of issues. I don't think, you know, it's, it's, it's the overall solution. It's part of the solution. And the gentleman asked before, what are we doing as a company? Uh, we take climate change very seriously. So we have greenhouse gas emission uh, uh, targets. We have CO2 emission targets, methane emission targets that are actually better than the targets set in COP21 in Paris. Hmm. So, so we try to do our share, but part of it is just engaging the public to make sure we get common understanding. So when a politician says, leave the oil in the ground, or batteries are the answer, we're not against, um, I'm against leaving oil in the ground, obviously. <laughs> we're not against, I better catch myself before it's too late. Uh, but on the battery side, batteries are part of it, but, but people have to re really be realistic that if we're gonna have better standard of living, especially for the developing countries of the world, World, we're going to have to find some way to mitigate and find a middle ground. Okay. Good, sir. Thank you. Um, can you speak to the effects that some of the other oil producing nations might have on the U.S. industry? And I'm talking about Mexico, the Middle East, uh, Russia, uh, perhaps. Uh, well, a, a couple of points. Uh, in terms of uh, security for our country, Shale has transformed us. We're the number one gas producer in the world. We're the number one oil producer in the world. We're going to be the number one natural gas exporter of LNG in the world. Uh, so it's totally transformed us economically. Uh, you know, when uh, someone tweets, I'll leave the person nameless, and says, I want low gasoline prices. I want oil prices down, down, down. Uh, that was probably good for the economy 15 years ago. Uh, when the consumption part of uh, the GDP was 70% and we used 9 million barrels a day of gasoline and we only had 5 million barrels a day of crude production. But what's interesting, today we have 9 million barrels a day of gasoline uh, consumption, but we have 12 million barrels a day of crude production. Uh, Shell uh, takes 100 billion a year of investment. We were talking about the need for more capital investment in our country. Shell has also enabled our country to reduce our trade deficit by half, saving over $350 billion. And on the gas side, uh, it's allowed us to take our carbon emissions down 10% over 10 years. And it also has our electric costs uh, 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 half of what they are in Europe. So that's the case for how shale has transformed uh, our energy economy. So we're less vulnerable now, but we are in a global business. So if something happens in Saudi Arabia or Russia that make prices go up, uh, that's gonna have an economic headwind in our country. There's no doubt about it. But I'd say our economic security is much stronger because of shale. Uh, those countries each have their own uh, uh, challenges, but one thing I will say, because this NOPEC uh, 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 legislation is coming forward, uh, what people don't realize, and it would be fun to uh, discuss this with what, Rob and what all of you. NOPEC means? Okay. Uh, it's legislation in our Congress against OPEC that basically says OPEC is a monopoly, OPEC manipulates prices, so therefore you can go after government assets of OPEC countries, uh, personal uh, uh, government officials in OPEC countries because they're doing antitrust. And I, I would only say one thing, I know some of the leaders of OPEC, uh, they really do look at themselves as the Federal Reserve of oil prices. And I've had certain government officials and policymakers in Washington today say, oh, do we need OPEC? I would say unequivocally, yes. I know hmm. uh, a lot of these leaders, they want stable prices. When uh, our country said we were gonna put sanctions on Iran to bring Iran to the table to curb their uh, state uh, sponsorship of of, uh, terror, which I happen to agree with, um, they signaled to the rest of the world that we were going to cut, the U.S. was going to cut by sanctions, Iranian oil exports from two and a half million barrels a day to zero. So Saudi ended up increasing their production a million barrels a day. They wanted to help. Abu Dhabi increased their production 200,000 barrels a day. Russia increased their production 200,000 barrels a day. So these are some of the uh, countries you were just talking about. They were actually trying to help our country so oil prices wouldn't skyrocket. And then at the last second, our government, yeah, without signaling it, said, you know what? We're going to give waivers for a million and a half of that, so we're only going to take a million barrels a day off the market instead of two and a half. What happened? Oil prices went from $76 to 42 So what... 
OPEC is doing now, uh, and that's not good for U.S. producers or the U.S. economy. And we're trying to educate policymakers in Washington that, you know, better signal better with our friends so we can have a better outcome and a smooth landing in case we take oil off the market. All I'm trying to say here is, you know, I know there's a lot of misrepresentation, maybe some of it's valid, maybe some of it's not, about some of the actors in these countries outside of the U.S. that are oil producers. I can speak for a number of people in OPEC. They are trying to keep the market stable. So prices aren't too high for consumers, but high enough so our own industry can work here in the United States. Good. Yes, sir. Hi, John Bullock. Uh, my question is about carbon taxes. Sure. Uh, several people have, uh, of both parties, have advocated a carbon tax to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. I just would like to see what is your opinion of that and what do you think the impact would be? I, I, I think we should do carbon taxes um, because, you know, CO2 is something uh, that, that you can't see. Uh, and, and if you put a price on it, you can see it. Uh, and you can't manage what you can't measure. And this way you could measure it. Uh, but I would let market solutions uh, allocate capital so it would force more people to be more efficient. I think that's a good thing. Um, so I would be definitely for it. Uh, the problem when you get the idea of a carbon tax, and Europe has uh, tried this, um, if certain industries or certain interest groups opt out, it's an imperfect tax and it doesn't always allocate capital the way it should. And the other thing I would suggest, uh, and I'd love Rob's thoughts on this, is that we mandate, and this is just a personal view as an American citizen, we mandate all the money that we raise, and it could be upwards of $100 billion a year, be done to reduce the deficit. You know, and, and just, you know, it's, it, you, some people call it a sin tax. You know, we've done this with cigarettes. Put carbon taxes out there, but say the only way we'll do it is if we reduce our deficit. Uh, Mr. Hess, so you talked about um, the value of business and how leaders need to get out and put that out into the community. Uh, so my question is, I'm currently reading a book called The Shareholder Value Myth that talks about um, is the utmost point of a corporation to increase value for shareholders. So I just want to know your opinion of what is the purpose of a corporation? Yeah, I would say it's to increase the value for all the stakeholders. Uh, probably the person that led the charge on this was General Johnson of Johnson & Johnson and his credo. And when you read his credo, he starts with his employees, he talks about the nurses, he talks about patients. Uh, and the, the last line is, and if we do all these things right, the shareholder will make a return. And I think there's a lot of lesson from that wisdom of what that credo is. And I talked earlier about the role of a business leader, and it's really to engage all your stakeholders. So it's not just your shareholders, it's not just your board, it's not just your employees, it's the communities where you do business, it's your business partners, uh, and uh, it's certainly the public at large, and, and it's being engaged. So you listen as well as uh, uh, you, you also say what your priorities are. So I, I, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you, and, I've, and we've talked a lot about this uh, here, and I've uh, so spent a lot of time in my career thinking about this. So given that, uh, if you're a public company CEO today, you've got to deal with shareholders with a shorter time yes. frame. You have to deal with activists. Yes. Uh, and, and I've noticed, if anything, the, sh the uh, time frame of a typical CEO, not by their own, has gotten shorter. Yes. Turnover among CEOs has gotten higher. How hard is it to do what you just said with a lot of the forces uh, affecting public company CEOs today? It's very difficult because, you know, I said for our business, we have a 10 year time horizon. Maybe in technology, it's a shorter time horizon, but you have to make investments. And investments sometimes mean cash deficits. And some people say, don't call it a cash deficit, call it an investment, but it is. Uh, but you have to balance the short term and long term. You have to execute every quarter, but you have to keep your eye on the long term ball. And we had an activist fight actually twice in the last five years because there was a lot of pressure on us because we were investing in Guyana and we were investing in the Bakken. Uh, and they were saying, hey, you know, your returns aren't coming quick enough. Sell some assets and buy your stock. And actually by doing that, you would make the cash generating capability of the company less. You would weaken the company. And that's also an objective, weaken the company so they have to sell themselves. So, so I'd say the short-term pressures are huge. They're huge on CEOs. They're 
huge on investment managers. Mm. And uh, I think, you know, that's a conversation we as a country have to have because I, I, I know you know this better than I, but Clay Christensen's done work on this at yeah. Harvard Business School yeah, yes. where I guess it was 20 years ago where he said of corporations' cash flow, 70% was to investment and 30% return to capital, meaning dividends and share buybacks to uh, shareholders. Those numbers have flipped where now American companies' cash flows, 70% is going back to shareholders and dividends and share repurchases, and only 30% is going to investment. So the short-term pressures are affecting our economy. And I think as a CEO or, or the uh, president of the Federal Reserve here, we have to talk about long-term investment in our country so we stay competitively advantaged. Yeah. Agree, please. Okay. Mr. Hess, um, thank you so much for your, you. your comments. Could you um, remind us about how much oil companies in North America pay into the federal government? You mentioned the leases in uh, the Gulf of Mexico. I assume those are federal leases. Would you have any idea what the industry contributes um, I don't have the exact number, but it's billions of dollars, I can tell you that. Yeah. I mean, 18% of all the production in the Gulf of Mexico, and that's about a million seven hundred thousand barrels a day, that goes right back to the government as mm. cash. And I'm wondering what the industry is doing to promote how much we contribute back to the federal government? Not enough. You gave me a good idea. <laughs> Remember they said I'm the executive committee of the API? We, we as an industry, and I'm to blame for it too, I'm part of the group, uh, don't tell our story well enough. We don't talk about how we lift people out of poverty, how important energy is to our economy. The $100 billion a year that we put in the economy has a multiplier effect. And so uh, I'm sure the API does it, but we need to do a better job. So thank you for that. Please. Sir. Hey, Rob, thank you hey, again you for doing? bringing this to us, uh, sure. the community. John, uh, thanks for your perspectives on the need for greater community engagement by corporations. You clearly walk the talk um, when you serve on uh, boards of three of the most significant nonprofits in New York. Talk to us a little bit about the balance. How do you manage that balance? Well, uh, I would tell you, my, my number one priority in life is my family, my wife, Susan, my three boys. Okay, so that's priority number one, two, and three. They're very understanding because, like Rob, uh, I tend to work a little bit. Um, and, <laughs> and, and, you know, my responsibilities to our company, uh, to make sure it's a stronger company than I was lucky enough to step in the shoes when I became CEO uh, in 1995, that takes a lot of time. Uh, so, so there's not much time left for social responsibility. And yet, as a family, we've always had social responsibility as a core value. And as a company, we've had it. So we just find ways to uh, basically give back. Uh, one of the most uh, impactful talks I ever had with anybody w was understanding about leadership and how one defines leadership. And it was with Shimon Peres, uh, as he was about a year before he died, he was prime minister and president two different times of Israel. And a friend of mine, I didn't have the guts to ask the question in his presence, asked, what's the secret of uh, being a great leader? And without even equivocating, and we're hesitating, he said, not to tell, but to serve. The whole idea of a servant leader. And so in many ways, our hmm. jobs as leaders is to serve others. And one of the best ways you can do that is to give back to your community. And while uh, Rob talked about, and, and the gentleman talked earlier about different institutions I've been involved with, a number of those, uh, we will be financially supportive. I can't be as active. But where I have been active, which was really a great honor, was working with Rob on the Harvard Business School campaign. He said, why would you do that? Harvard already has money. That's the spiel we always got. But you know, one of the things Harvard <laughs> Business School does is educate 900 leaders, future leaders of the world every year. And if you want to talk a multiplier and impact, helping people get educated to make a positive difference in the world, there's a lot of leverage to that. And Rob and I were lucky enough to be part of Harvard Business School. And just like we stand on the shoulders of others who made that opportunity for us, we owe it to society to help others that, who are succeeding us. One area that I do get involved in besides Harvard Business School is Mount Sinai Hospital. Um, there's a medical research uh, 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 lab there uh, that we've been very involved in. And so I'm in 
involved in overseeing uh, medical research. Again, it's helping lives, help people uh, uh, cure disease or, or, or certainly mitigate it. Um, so those are two areas where I've spent time, but there isn't a whole bunch else. So some of those other institutions are important. Those are more where I contribute to those financially, but I can't contribute to them in time because I don't have much time. So it's making choices, but it's basically trying to leverage yourself and making sure you carve X percent of your time each year to give back to society. And our own company practices that as well. We were in a country called Equatorial Guinea. That became one of those mature assets that we sold, but we were there for about 15 years. It's about 700,000 people on the west coast of Africa, and their literacy was, was terrible. And the president of the country said, don't give me fish, teach me how to fish. He said it in Spanish. Hmm. And I thought he was, I speak Spanish. I thought he was telling me to eat fish. No, what he was <laughs> telling me, he needed help in education. And 80% of the kids there don't go past sixth grade. And we had a $100 million program, half S, half the government of Equatorial Guinea, to improve the literacy in that country where we educated 1,200 teachers and we touched probably 50,000 lives. So those are examples of where we can make a difference either as a family or as a company. And I just think it's got to be part of your DNA. It's part of Rob's. He's done great work. I know he's worked on Teak. My wife was one of his understudies taking someone to mentor. Uh, but I think part of your job uh, and part of your obligation as being part of society is to give back and help others. Uh, nice. Mr. Hess, uh, my name is Bill New. We're a, uh, Thank you. <clears throat> we fabricate equipment for deep water oil and gas. I appreciate uh, Hess has been a very good customer of ours. Okay, uh, we're building a lot of equipment for Guyana right now. Uh, way, I was this, just kind of curious. This gentleman is uh, also went to Harvard Business School in the executive program. Okay, good. We'll uh, have to talk afterwards. Yeah, Rob was one of my professors. <laughs> uh, uh, I was kind of curious what your long-term outlook for the Gulf of Mexico is. Well, I actually think the Gulf of Mexico has a lot of opportunity left in it, and it's probably one of the most prolific uh, uh, basins in the world on oil and on gas. Uh, we talk about technology helping shale. Well, technology is really help the Gulf of Mexico, where uh, cycle times have been reduced both in drilling and in development, but also imaging has been exponentially improved by being, uh, computers being able to handle more and manage more data and give more uh, uh, iterations to what those images are. So our own company is using the downturn where a lot of people are exiting the deep water Gulf to get back into it. So last year, we, for us, it was a lot of money. We spent $36 million to get 16 blocks. Some of them are tied backs to infrastructure. Some of them are what's called the Miocene horizon, and some are what's called the Cretaceous horizon, which, by the way, is the same horizon that's so prolific in uh, Guyana. So, so we think the Gulf of Mexico still has great opportunity. But it's Rob's point. you got to have a strong balance sheet. And a friend of mine actually said, if you're going to play a deep water game, you got to have a deep water balance sheet. And yes, you got a shallow water balance sheet. That's why I say cash is king. Uh, but you got to make choices. With low oil prices, you can't feed every mouth. you got to make choices. So uh, we've got a few minutes left, yes. so let me ask a little bit about, uh, about the United States. Um, I don't know you think a lot about this. What are, the, what are the one or two or three biggest challenges you see for this country? What would you like to see us do differently to, uh, to improve the United States? Uh, I think the, one of the biggest challenges we have is for the people that haven't been brought along by the economy's success, is to find ways, whether it's uh, the income tax credit for individuals, uh, helping people uh, get access to opportunities and work. I think we have to help more people in this country. We used to always have the helping hand. I think that's up to, business can do that without the government telling right. them to do it. Right. So it's work in the communities, uh, and then hopefully the, that idea of clusters that Michael Porter talks about spreads. Uh, I, I, I do worry uh, about our withdrawal from the world. Uh, I think we are a force for good as a country, not just in right. business. Uh, and our econ uh, economy and our way of life, I think, is a model for others. And by us withdrawing, uh, others who aren't so friendly to humankind are taking advantage of that. Uh, and so I am worried about, you know, I'm not saying we should be the world's policemen, but I also don't think we should be so unilateral and insulated that we don't engage. Because uh, what the world looks like without American leadership is a lot worse than with American leadership. And thank you. And, you know, the other thing, 
Uh, and this, uh, I think I would trust Rob uh, and the Federal Reserve with certainly being a voice of reason. I think we are uh, building uh, deficits in our country that we're going to burden our kids and our uh, grandchildren. And I think someone's got to say, you got to take off the adrenaline now to make the world stronger financially going forward for America. And you can't just keep giving things out. So, you know, this country was built on people that had a work ethic and they also were financially disciplined. And I think we need that culture back. In close, if you had to give it, I mean, I know a number of people in this room that by the fact they're here tonight, they're interested in the community, they're interested in the country, uh, they're civic minded. If you had to give one piece of advice to people in the audience who say, gee, I'd like to find one more thing to do, I'd like to do more in the community. Uh, what advice would you give people in this room who want to get I, more involved? I don't stay on the sidelines, engage, have your voice heard. Uh, it's so important um, that, you know, obviously everybody, when there are elections, you vote, but day to day, uh, engage. Uh, I think each one of us individually and collectively working together to, can make this country great again. And I mean it in a very different way than prior presidents have said. <laughs> I think, you know, what built this country was a hard work ethic, you know, saving money, uh, investing for the long term, uh, making sure everybody had a chance to better themselves, education, health care. Um, these are all really important issues. And if we stand on the sidelines, we deserve what we get. But if we get on the playing field, I think the country is going to be a lot better off. John, thank you very much. Thank you for your leadership.